Welcome to a new edition of South Sound Business Report. Today looking at museums that show how we got here. Stay tuned. Hello, I'm Jeff Rounds. Thanks for joining us. And thanks also to Rainier Connect, a locally owned telecommunications company that's sponsoring this episode of our program. This is the brand new LeMay America's Car Museum, scheduled to open this summer. We'll go inside in a little bit. But first, let's join associate editor of the Business Examiner, Holly Smith-Peterson, for a look at another local museum themed around transportation. Today we're talking with Terry Thorning, Executive Director of the Olympic Flight Museum. Terry, thanks for having us here today. Thanks for coming out. Well, we love the museum. It's a fascinating tourist attraction for Thurston County. So can you tell us how it got started? The museum was founded in 1998 by our Chief President, Brian Reynolds, mm -hmm. who um, uh, filed nonprofit status and opened the museum to the public. So is this his private collection? It is his private collection. Okay. And was this his private hangar, or did he set up the whole museum beforehand and then you went out? And no, he, he purchased the hangar to house um, his aircraft, and then uh, after we achieved nonprofit status, he opened it to the museum, and we had a museum um, dedication in 1998, um, shortly after um, the South Puget Sound Air Show that year. And you came on board in 1999. I was hired in 1999. I was the um, second employee. And, and a part-time employee at and that. And a part-time employee. And then what happened, though? Well, I was hired at um, 20 hours a week. And after about three weeks, I realized there was an awful lot of work to do in getting a new museum up and running. And I remember I was changed to full-time mm -hmm. within, within a few short weeks. I can so. imagine. You just had to start from the ground up, yeah. so to speak. Well, today, about how many visitors does the museum see? We see about 25,000 visitors through our doors a year now. Um, but when you consider all of our outreach activities, we probably engage with about 35,000 people a year. Okay. And about how many members do you have? Because I know that's really grown. It has. We have about 400 family members and a very large volunteer base that uh, we could not operate without. So. Okay. Well, let's talk about the specific ex exhibits first. Um, what are a couple of your most rare uh, tourist attractions, the must-sees, that if somebody's coming from Seattle, what do they really come for to see at first? I think our P-51 Mustang is probably on the top of the list as our headliner. It is a World War II fighter. Well, what makes our collection unique is that our aircraft all maintain airworthiness, and they do fly, and we exhibit them every year at our air show and, and selected other events. So the Mustang is definitely a must-see when a visitor comes. And why is that something that they want to see? It's a World War II fighter, and it was um, very famous during um, the 40s and 50s era. Um, a lot of veterans remember it fondly. And you said, I think there's a Husky that's also... We do. We have um, a Cayman H-43 Husky, which was a 1950s era helicopter used for fire suppression and rescue. It has been fully restored and is the only flying example of its type in the world. And you also have, I think, a model of a Japanese... We do have a Tora Zero. And that is uh, a Japanese, uh, the, the Tora was a, or the Zero was a Japanese fighter that um, it was very active in World War II. And we have a Tora Zero, which is a modified trainer aircraft that has, was made to look like a real um, Japanese fighter for the mov movie industry. So it actually made a movie appearance in Tora Tora It's Tora? made several, actually, <laughs> yes. Okay. Now tell us about your helicopters. They have a very, about the roles that they had in the war and uh, why they're so special. We do have a number of helicopters in the collection, um, mainly Vietnam era helicopters. We have a AH-1 Cobra gunship that uh, is one of just a handful that are privately owned in the United States. The That's the one right okay. here, yeah. And we also have um, two Huey helicopters, um, very well-known helicopters from the Vietnam era. 
and then uh, an OH-6 scout helicopter just behind you that was used with the uh, Huey and the Cobra in the pink team during Vietnam. So what was its function compared to the others? It, um, the scout's helicopter mm -hmm. was um, utilized to sort of draw out enemy territory and positions, so like flush, them, flush out. them out so that the Cobra and the, and the Huey could move in. Okay. Yeah. Now, besides coming to the museum, you have um, sp some specific events that make up a good part of your, your revenue. Um, tell us about your biggest event. Our biggest event is the Olympic Air Show every June, every Father's Day weekend in June, and it serves as our primary fundraiser. Um, we see about at least 10,000 people over the weekend. So um, that's a big economic that's driver. That's a big economic driver for the city of Tumwater and for the whole region. Um, at that event, we exhibit our helicopters and our aircraft, um, many in which in an air, in a, many are exhibited in aerobatics with okay, aerobatic so they flying go fly. they go up and fly we also invite military branches to come in and exhibit too um, there's a number of private warbird owners that will bring their planes in for display as well and also you're going to make an appearance at Freedom Fest in Tacoma this year Freedom that's Fest at Tacoma yes that's a new one for us we'll be exhibiting our um, AH-1 Cobra and our Huey helicopter in a demonstration. So they'll actually do the maneuvers that they will They do will. It's a time. choreographed routine. Okay. Yeah. Um, now, what, um, about what percentage of your revenue do the events bring in? They bring in about 30, 35 to 40 percent of our annual revenue. And then you do other things too, um, such as open this to private we have, um, well, we have a number of other activities. We have a membership program where um, families can join the museum and receive benefits for that membership. We also have a facility rental program where um, our clients can rent the facility and parties, have private wedding. parties, weddings, prom. Okay. I have at least a couple proms a year here. And I know you're very kid friendly. Um, you do things like paper airplane contests and so on. Tell us about the exhibits outside that people might not know about. We have two mobile fuselages that are non-operational and children can access them. Children old and new too. <laughs> so you um, have adults it's for adults, yeah, they enjoy it just as much and they can access these fuselages and sit at the controls in the pilot seat and for many people it's a first-hand experience at, at flying. So they, and you take these to other places as well? They participate in other community events and parades. Yes, very active in the community. Well, so tell me, what's coming up for the museum? What are you looking at in the next couple of, I don't know, next few months? At the end of March, we'll have our Militaria show and sale. And then there's something coming up also with a fashion show in the fall, I think This said. fall, we'll be hosting our first Beauty and Duty event, which features women's military uniforms from World War II to current. Okay. Well, tell me a little bit about that. Who has the collection and how many, you know, how many uh, uniforms does she have? The collection is owned by Alice Miller, who is a local historian and collector. Um, I don't know how many uniforms she has, but dozens I think and dozens. dozens and dozens, and they are absolutely beautiful, beautifully be models, displayed, so. yeah. and she, I think, will bring about a half a dozen live models to show the uniforms, their construction, why they were made the way they were, what the materials used were, etc. Now, besides the private collection, you have had a few exhibits that have come your way in, in interesting, by interesting methods. Um, for example, a box by a garbage dump, I think you said. Tell us about that one. We were donated a, a, a box of instruments mm -hmm. by a museum um, member. We weren't sure what they were. So he just he found this box next to a dumpster, and yeah. so we cleaned the instruments, and a couple of our volunteers um, looked at them carefully and determined that they actually came from a B-17 bomber. Okay, and another one came from someone's collection of models? Yes, we have an extensive scale model collection on display that was one half of that modeler's lifetime achievement uh, that were donated to the museum after he passed away. And he was um, colorblind, 
And so he built these models in his hobby room downstairs and his wife would come downstairs and pick his paint colors based on the picture on the box. It's a good so, marriage. Yeah, it is. <laughs> well, just one final question. If you could have uh, one or two more exhibits or pieces or planes, what would they be? What are you looking at? Uh, what do you have your eye on? Well, we actually have an aircraft returning to the collection, hopefully in 2013, and it is our flagship aircraft. It's called a Corsair. It was a World War II fighter uh, that was used in the Pacific. It is currently undergoing um, a very extensive restoration in Idaho. It's been away for a couple of years, and we're really hoping to have it back in 2013. So we'll have to get more people, people yeah. visiting and more people. It'll be very it. exciting. Well, Terry Thorning, thank you so much for your time and for having us out here. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Holly and Terry Thorning, for that visit to the Olympic Flight Museum in Tumwater. Coming up, a special preview inside LeMay, America's Car Museum. Stay tuned. Here in Tacoma, there's a unique telecommunications company that knows how to serve their local community. We believe in doing business locally, giving back, and connecting local businesses. And with Rainer Connect being a local provider, we feel it's essential for us to do business with them. Rainier Connect, one company working to grow your business or to simply help you connect. Thank you for choosing Rainier Connect. Paul Miller, recently named Vice President of Operations for the LeMay America's Car Museum, is with us to share the story of this magnificent four-story structure. But first, let's watch a video about the historic aspects of the Harold LeMay collection. Harold and Nancy LeMay amassed the largest privately owned collection of automobiles in the world, totaling over 3,000 at its peak, according to the Guinness Book of World Records. The collection has been said to be one of the best representations of the history of the American automobile over the course of the 20th century, with various makes and models that range from the early brass era to the modern era. It was Harold's dream to permanently house the collection to be on display and shared with the public after he was gone. Harold and Nancy started the nonprofit museum in 1998 and committed themselves to donating the vast LeMay collection to the museum for the benefit of the community. After Harold passed away in 2000, Nancy continued where the two had left off. In 2003, the Board of Directors approved the incredible design concepts for the new museum, and the fundraising campaign followed. With a plan for the facilities to be built next to the Tacoma Dome, not only will the new museum house Harold's collection, but will also include an event show field, a collector car center, education facility, and a theater in the round, along with many other state-of-the-art features to be included in this world-class experience. LeMay, America's Car Museum, will provide a venue to explore history, design, technology, and restoration where car enthusiasts of all ages and backgrounds can come together to celebrate their love affair with the automobile. Paul Miller, I mentioned a few minutes ago your recent appointment as Chief Operations Officer for LeMay, America's Car Museum, but I've known you for decades. Yeah. Uh, former, Let's just leave it broad. <laughs> yes, I think so. A former Tacoma City Council member, Deputy Mayor at one time, 
uh, a local player in, in large fashion in real estate development in, in all ways. But really, you've been a part of this LeMay Museum effort from the beginning, haven't you? Yes, I have. I uh, participated with Ray Corpus before the concept of the museum even uh, came about in reaching out to Harold and trying to convince him to do something with his collection uh, while he still had a chance. And who else was involved in those early days? Well, uh, we had a large, uh, aside from certainly some elected officials who got involved, Ray Corpus gets a lot of credit for pushing the idea. City we had manager. City of manager of Tacoma at the time. And a number of civic individuals, uh, Carl Anderson among them, who still is at, with the effort today, who sat on uh, an early uh, site selection board to try and identify if we were going to have a museum, where would be the best place for that museum to be. That, started, that effort started back in the 1990s, uh, 1997, 1998. And uh, so some of those individuals, as I mentioned, Carl Anderson, John Barline, our, uh, Jamie Will, they're still at the table today after 12 years trying to make sure this dream comes about. This has to be a, a satisfying, a rewarding time for all of you who have put so much into it. And yes, today it's a paid employment gig for you, right. but it's about a passion, really. Yes. Um, tell me what you're feeling as we're rolling towards the June opening. <laughs> uh, fear. <laughs> I've got three months to make sure that this museum is not just uh, complete as a building, but is ready to operate. And so it's a very short window in which to do that. But at the same time, uh, I think that you'll see some very exalted celebrations come June from, from people who have put 12 years of their life in making sure that this project came about. Uh, and most of those people not making it come about for the collection or for Harold, but for the city and what impact it can have on our community. Uh, so very excited to, to get to June and, and actually have the doors open and have people come in and appreciate what we've been able to enjoy for the last 12 years too. As we get closer to the grand opening, of course, we'll all be shown more of the details. It's probably too early to talk specifically. So let's talk about the building. This okay. is something that anyone traveling through our community or living in our community has seen mm -hmm. the building. Give me the, the thumbnail of what we have here. 165,000 square feet, largest car museum in the United States, uh, second largest in the world, second only to the BMW Museum, uh, manufacturer's museum. Uh, so that's a lot of square footage uh, of display. We're able to display and accessibly display to the public uh, about 275 to 300 cars in the museum. That's about half the collection that the museum entity owns. The family will continue to own any number of cars, mm -hmm. uh, 1,000 to 1,500 above that out at uh, Marymount. Uh, uh, it's a big facility, and you don't realize that until you actually get into it. There's 35 million pounds of concrete, 2 million pounds of steel, uh, 24 miles of steel uh, studs for the walls. It, it was a big undertaking. Uh, and yet driving by it, I didn't have a sense for how large it is. We're now inside of it. It's my first visit, and yet we're only on one floor. Yes. What else are we not seeing in this shot? There's four and a half floors to the museum. So while the top floor, as you can see, is an open plate with a high ceiling that allows for cars to be distributed out across that plate to be shown. Uh, it is designed with a series of ramps around both sides. In particular, there's six ramps that will act as galleries, gives us the ability to theme each of those galleries and change them over time so that we can have a, a collection of 12 cars around the British invasion or Ferraris in America or custom coachworks and really tell the cultural background behind what was going on during that era. We then have storage for the vehicles that the public has complete access to, to see. We have a, a series of six galleries on the end that'll be themed out as to whether it's media or design, technology, or any number of, of rotating exhibits that go through those end galleries, plus um, a, <laughs> a series of uh, speed galleries that'll have racing simulators and slot cars, uh, theater in the round, banquet halls. There's a lot in this building. And yet, it's different than what 
many of us heard about in the earlier days. And I think one of the things that you just mentioned is news to me, and that is that there will still be a LeMay family collection mm -hmm. separate from the museum. Is that, is that something that was thought up during the 12 years? Well, I think what you have to look at is the scale of the collection. Right. This museum will be the largest car museum in, the, in America. We'll have 400 cars, 375 cars on display here. That's half of our collection. The, mu the, the family's collection is close to another 1,500 on top of the 800 we have. So just the scale of taking care of that many cars is huge. So the family will continue to have it accessible. They'll have it available to the public to see. So uh, it just won't be as accessible as this museum. Okay, and it'll be presented differently. Yes. Um, we also have an active connection to today's car collector community, don't we, within, this, within America's Car Museum. Tell me about that. Well, uh, this museum currently has about 1,400 members. We have uh, probably a dozen or better car clubs that are ongoing members of the museum. Uh, those are people who are passionate about not just the museum, but about cars, that collect cars. The, the intent is that this is a gathering place. It's not just a museum. It's not just a stoic place where cars can be come, you can come and see cars. And they get it's a gathering, yeah. yeah. This is where you come and it's hands-on, where you can come with your friends. We have an area in the basement called Club Auto Tacoma that we have five of these around the nation right now where you can be a member, you can gather on Saturday mornings or Wednesday nights with other car collectors and share stories. You can store your car here so rather than taking a couple of your buddies out to a storage unit right, somewhere, right. you can have here, you can have a gathering place, and you have uh, all, uh, everybody's cars available to be seen at the same time. And it's available for viewing by the public also? Absolutely, absolutely. So really it becomes an entertainment experience more so than a dusty old garage with cars in it. That is the intent, that this is, we're not like other car museums. This is an opportunity where, yes, you can come and see the cars that, that you really want to come and see, but you can also come and get a, an understanding of the cultural uh, venue in which those cars existed. You can come and understand what drove the design, whether that is low riders or uh, fins or, or uh, technical issues like car, uh, car headlights. And you can also get hands-on. You can get in and race and, and choose one in the simulators, not the, not, the, <laughs> not the cars, in the simulators, and race your friends and have uh, parties that allow you to come down and have fun with the slot cars and race slot cars. In, in a more private setting or Absolutely. after hours or, or on schedule, whatever. This doesn't happen. It didn't happen overnight, 12, million, or 12 years. Mm -hmm. How many million dollars? This is a $60 million project. Uh, that is phase one. Uh, what we're sitting on is a campus setting. We decided y years ago that, that we would create a, a campus uh, for this uh, venue. So the second phase is, uh, sits up on the upper parking lots uh, of our site. You've got a three acre show field that sits here that will be used as a gathering place for uh, outdoor concerts, for car shows, for uh, drive-in theaters. Um, so the 60 million is just this first phase structure that includes the show field. As long as we're talking dollars, what, what is the calculated economic impact of this new museum? Uh, we've had studies done. Uh, the impact from this uh, first phase is projected at $34 million a year into the local economy. Per uh, year? Per year. Uh, 50 to 60 full-time employees associated with it. We had. 14,000 man hours uh, go into the construction of this building. Uh, and so at a time when the economy was struggling and in particular construction was, coming, was struggling, our timing in terms of providing those jobs in the local market was just tremendous. And it will be opening June 1st, 2nd, 3rd, whether I'm ready or not. Awesome, awesome. <laughs> and, I, and I say 1st, 2nd, 3rd, it is a three-day party okay. uh, because we've been clear that this isn't just an open the doors. We want it to be about fun. And so it will be a party for three days. And you expect that people who will be here for the first opening weekend, you would anticipate they'll come back 
later on in the summer or through the winter? I mean, this is a year-round We attraction. certainly hope so for, for a couple of reasons. One, that opening weekend, there is going to be more people than you'd normally want to see right. at a museum. There's going to be long lines for activities that you might want to see. We will continue to have major shows throughout the summer. We've got four major shows scheduled throughout the summer. But we'll be rotating our exhibits. Where you come in the first time, you will see six different exhibits on the ramps and one large exhibit on the top plate. We have the ability to change those exhibits out, so we'll change a ramp every two to three months. So if you were to come back five months later or six months later, half the museum has changed. It really so is a repeat experience. It is a repeat experience. And this is something that's drawing attention really across the country, isn't it? Well, we were recently listed as one of the eight top openings in the world to watch. That, for 2012. For 2012, including, including listed in there uh, were the Avenue of Luxor in, in Egypt. Uh, and so we were in pretty good company for, for being uh, noted in the Wall Street Journal for what we, we want to be uh, viewed as worldwide. So this will bring out-of-town folks and, and, and they will stay and they'll be overnight and, and leave some income behind as they go back home. What would you suggest is the best way for local residents, for Puget Sound residents, for Washingtonians to really connect with this museum? Well, I think recognize the value that this museum brings to this community, both in terms of worldwide stage, in terms of economic impact from outside, and the value of having this kind of a resource in your backyard to be able to come and see and participate. Become a member. Come and visit the museum. Volunteer with the museum. Get involved with the activities that we will have year-round. Make this museum what we want it to be, which is a very active social center. Connect a place where the, the community comes and yeah. connects the family. Awesome. So, Thank you. You're welcome. Paul Miller, Chief Operations Officer for LeMay, America's Car Museum. We want to thank a number of corporate sponsors for making the production of this program possible. Rainier Connect, Northwest Media Company, Elliott Bay Web Design, Dunright Handyman Services, FTEMagazine.com, and Mobility Hosting. We'll be right back. Here in Tacoma, there's a unique telecommunications company that knows how to serve their local community. We believe in doing business locally, giving back, and connecting local businesses. And with Rainier Connect being a local provider, we feel it's essential for us to do business with them. Rainier Connect, one company working to grow your business or to simply help you connect. Thank you for choosing Rainier Connect. We'll be back again next week with another South Sound Business Report and invite you to join us. Tune in the same time and channel.